Hi, I'm Alana. I use they and she pronouns. And I'm Jessie. I use she and her pronouns. And, and we're, we're making mentions. Today, we're talking to Soul Weiss. Introduce yourself, Soul. What are your pronouns? Where do you call home? What is your astrological sign if you're into that? And what kind of art do you make? Hey, so happy to be here with you all. My name's Soul. I use they, them pronouns. I live currently in Leeds, Massachusetts, which is Nipmuc Pacumtuck land. And I am a Libra sun, Cancer rising, Leo moon. So it's my season. And yeah, I make a lot of different kinds of art. I think I'm mostly a visual artist. I've also really enjoyed like song making, music making, culture making. And my like main art form is painting and printmaking. Yeah. I love a Libra sun. I've really, I was telling Jesse I had a coming to through my life where I was like, actually, I love Libras and they're wonderful and Libra season is great. So shout out to your season. Today's episode, while we talk with Soul and learn about all of the amazing work that they do, we're also going to be talking a little bit about the holiday Sukkot. And Jesse and I are going to start off with a quick little Sukkot 101 overview, I guess as quick as I can make a Sukkot overview. Um, and then we'll invite Soul in to talk about some of their connections to Sukkot and some of their art in general. What is Sukkot? I've always loved Sukkot. Growing up, this was my favorite time of the year in our temple. I loved getting to singing all the prayers and songs outside in the sukkah that our Jewish community would build right outside our temple. I've always felt really connected to being outside and feeling spiritual that way. And this always felt like the perfect culmination of all the things that mattered to me. In general, Sukkot or sukkah in general means booth or hut. So it, the holiday itself is named after these structures that you see built around this time of year. It's a harvest festival, and it's the first of three of the major festivals within Judaism. And these pilgrimage festivals were times that people were commanded to make a pilgrimage to the temple in Jerusalem. So these really significant holidays of spirituality during the year. And it's the first that happens during the year. But it's a harvest festival because it's connected to the harvest season in the fall. The time of year that it comes is a time of agricultural harvest, and you're supposed to be living in the fields, doing this harvesting. So the idea is that people would live in the fields, harvesting this food in these sukkahs that they would build. It's really a time of joy and a time of giving thanks to the land and the earth that surrounds us. Another way that it is connected to Judaism is people say that it is a commemoration of the 40-year time in the desert after the exodus from Egypt. And it commemorates these temporary shelters that people wandering in the desert would build. So the twofold, we have that Jewish spiritual element, this very ancient biblical element, and the very real agricultural harvest element. And both are present and can resonate differently with people. Something that I really liked when I was doing some research about Sukkot was this idea that the Sukkot was to remind us that our existence is really fragile because it's like this very fragile structure. And so it's supposed to remind us that we want to treasure these really joyous moments and focus on the beauty of the world that we live in. Because when you're in a sukkah, you're supposed to be able to see the sky and it's built with this natural material. And so it's really supposed to bring us back into the natural world. It's also a gathering place. The point is for guests to be welcomed into it, both living guests and ancestral guests. An element of Sukkot that I'll mention is all about bringing in ancestral guests, like our own ancestors and like biblical ancestors into the sukkah. So it's about, again, community building and spending time together in the natural world. Jesse, when does Sukkot happen? Sukkot happens five days after Yom Kippur, um, and it lasts for a week. And you're supposed to start building the sukkah the night Yom Kippur ends. 
which I am actually really glad you asked me this question, Alana, because the neighborhood in which I live is very, I think, Sephardi and some Ashkenazi, but very Jewish. And so the night Yom Kippur ended, it was like literally 18 different Lulav and Etrogim like booths popped up on the street. And all the Judaica places were open and these little boys were like running back and forth being like, excuse me, excuse me, with like arms full of sukkah supplies. And it was just really cute. And it is a wild neighborhood, but it is very interesting to see on Sukkot. And it was as of my first time seeing like the immediacy of building the sukkah right after Yom Kippur ends. I would love to hear from you, Alana, about some Ashkenazic traditions around Sukkot because there are some interesting ones that are somewhat unconventional for other Jewish holidays, I think. Yeah. So I guess I actually don't know if these are Ashkenazic specific. I just know that's the lens that we're speaking from. And I am not 100% sure if there are other traditions that are observed for Sukkot in other Jewish backgrounds, but at least some core traditions that I'm familiar with are that you build the sukkah. And so this happens the eve of when Yom Kippur has ended. Actually, I saw something that I think was on Jew Witches story, where even if you're not going to start building, you're supposed to at least lay out the tools. So this idea that you're starting the process, even if you're not physically doing it yet. The sukkah is supposed to have a roof, but the roof is supposed to be made with a leafy material, some sort of plant material called shachach. And so plant material that's no longer connected to the earth, and it is supposed to have three sides with one open to welcome people into the space. It's also traditional for it to be decorated with a lot of stuff. I remember growing up, our Torah school would always decorate the inside of the sukkah when it was done being built, really with whatever feels good to you. But in some traditions, they decorate it with imagery of the lulav and etrog. You're supposed to, if you can, eat in the sukkah, and if you are really ambitious, sleep in the sukkah, and really just live your life in the sukkah during the week of Sukkot. The lulav and the etrog are like the big guys of Sukkot. And I don't know, we had a song for it growing up. I don't know if everyone sang that song, and I won't be singing it. But the lulav is this bundle of palm, willow, and myrtle that's bound together. And an etrog is a citrus fruit. And you are supposed to hold these together. And these are known as the four species, Arabat, Hamanim. And you are supposed to shake them in all six directions. You're supposed to shake it up and down, north, south, east, west, or like around your synagogue, symbolizing that the presence of the divine is everywhere. And you're supposed to do this every day of the holiday. Something that I really like is that each of the plants in the lulav is symbolic. And so... They're supposed to represent different parts of the body. For example, the palm branch is representing the spine. The myrtle leaf is the eye. The willow leaf is supposed to embody the mouth. And then the etrog is a manifestation of the heart. And when we shake these in each of the directions, along with being reminded that divine presence is all around us, we're also remembering that we want to use all of these parts of our body for good and for goodness. And the final tradition that I thought was pretty cool, and I guess I've never really thought about in this laid out way, but is part of the Sukkot service, is Ush Pazin. And it's actually originated through Kabbalic tradition. And you recite this prayer to invite in these, quote unquote, exalted guests. These are ancestral guests. So like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses who correlate with the lower sephirot, which that is a conversation for another podcast. We cannot get into all the sephirot today. It would take forever. And so this is this welcoming of these biblical and ancestral guests and speaks to this idea that we are welcoming even those who don't walk among us or walk alongside us physically into this celebration of land and life with us. Something that this is reminding me so much of not to immediately call you in soul, but thinking about the different representations of the leaves and the lulab, I feel like the first time that I understood more of a Jewish conception of at least I'm looking at my wall because I have the sacred orchard poster on my wall is looking at this sacred orchard poster that was created by you and Dory Midnight that talks about the Jewish significance of the willow tree or leaves. I'm curious if in your creation of that, Sukkot was coming up for you at all, 
And if you could speak more maybe to that project and also your favorite parts about Sukkot. Yeah. Thank you for all of that background. It was nice to listen to just get brought into the holiday a little bit. Yeah, definitely working on that project. Willow feels very associated with Sukkot for me. Maybe I'll back up and just talk about the holiday first. As I said before, I am a Libra, so that means I had a lot of birthday parties in the sukkah (laughs) growing up. So it feels like I have very personal, sweet memories of building a sukkah growing up and that being a time where beauty got to be part of our spiritual practice and nature got to be part of our spiritual practice. And throughout my life, I feel like Sukkot has been a really sweet theme and like a peak moment in whatever community iteration I'm in. Most recently, I was part of Link of Legal Queer Jewish Chicken Farm in the Hudson Valley for about five years. I just want to name my co-directors at Link of Legal, Hannah Rusinov, Margot Siegel, and Ollie Schwartz. Everything that we did there was super collaborative. Just can't really talk about the project without naming how collective it was. So just deep appreciation for all the thinking and work that went into all the things that I'm going to talk about now. And Sukkot was our big annual gathering where we had this off-grid farm and we would invite people to come. We build a big sukkah and we do a very Hamish, scrappy, DIY queer Sukkot retreat. And it was so messy and so joyful as Sukkot should be. And I think my favorite part about Sukkot, you mentioned so many of the best parts about it, but I think I really have a value around living in closeness to the elements and that being a part of my lifestyle and my Jewish practice. And I love that we have a holiday where that's your job for the week is to go be uncomfortable outside. And personally, I don't receive it as being uncomfortable. I'm like, yes, I want to go live in a hut. (laughs) And just the joy that is more accessible when we don't have our creature comforts. Something we would always talk about at Link of Legal is Sukkot is about being in vulnerability and being far away from the things that usually give us security and reminding us that the institutions and structures and walls that we are taught give us security are actually not what keep us safe and that community and joy and connection to the earth are like where real security lies. And I was thinking this week as my house, we were building our sukkah and I was like, this is wild that so many people all over the world are doing this right now. This is not a small project that every year we go out and build a structure um, that is shaky enough to be built in five days, but strong enough to live in, give or take. But I just always felt because the holiday is like, it's the season of our joy. We're collecting the harvest. We're praying for rain. That's also a really central part of the holiday is praying for rain for the next year and feeling the closeness to spirit after we've just done this massive underworld dive through Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur into the hard parts of ourselves and our relationships. And then we emerge on the other side ready to be celebratory in community, which is marked by literally building a fort. And I just always felt like, yeah, we're getting to build vision forts of creating for a moment a pocket where we get to create the world of our dreams and just eat good food and have the people closest to us and get to be close to the earth. So I always felt like that was such a sweet invitation to create a world for a week. Something that I was reminded of when you were talking and just talking about the fact that we literally build these structures for a week that we live in. I was just reading Upstream by Mary Oliver, which Jesse actually got me for my birthday because she knows me so freaking well. And in one of the essays in the book, Mary Oliver is talking about building this structure, this house in her yard where she lived and how she just really wanted to build a structure that she could exist in. And the point was it for it to be perfect and have all of these amenities in it. She just wanted to know that she could build it and be present for the building of it and be able to connect with herself within it. And she wasn't talking about a sukkah, but as I think about all the time Mary Oliver is very Jewish coded and something about that concept of her just simply connecting with the building process of building this house for her to exist in even though she literally had a house felt very connected to Sukkot and I was just reminded of that when you were talking about the building of Sukkot. Love that. Thank you for bringing up Sacred Orchard and I think what I want to say about the poster is just shout out to Dory Midnight really all of the writing on there comes from her many years of research and learning and it was really fun to get to collaborate together and illustrate yeah just be like what are the plants that want us to share about them right now and it was for Tubishvad, and there were just like seven trees that were like we're the ones 
But Willow in particular, I mentioned that it does feel a lot like Sukkot to me, I think mostly because of my time observing Sukkot at Link of Legal. We were on a field which butted up against a marsh, and on the edge of the marsh were a lot of baby willow trees. And so every year when we would build the sukkah, we would go into the phragmite zone, which are these big reeds that grow in the marsh, and then we'd harvest the phragmites to be the skach. And usually we would make a clearing, like you have to go through this phragmite forest to get to a secret room in the reeds. And often at the edge of the phragmites were these willow trees. So it just felt meaningful that we got to celebrate Sukkot so close to the willow trees. And one practice that we did there, Link of Legal, was a diasporist project, which means that we were really focused on cultivating land connection where we make home and that being part of our work of building Judaism beyond Zionism and really like shifting the Jewish cultural imagination away from we are missing something that is in Eretz Yisrael and more like we get to build where we are now. And that means building relationships of accountability to the history of the places where we are now and also not abandoning the complicity that we have in what's happening in the Middle East. But one of the ways that we would bring that into practice was most lulav and etrog are sourced from the nation state of Israel. And we would often have a practice of what are four species that spoke to us from the land we were on and invite people to harvest and be in their own relationship with the plants. And it was really special to me that willow was right there. I guess another piece about the willow is it's such a grief plant. It's like a grief water baby. And I love that, like with all Jewish rituals, it's like joy, but don't forget the sadness. And I feel like Willow is really doing that at Sukkot. It's like season of our joy. We're celebrating. We're singing Visamachta. And we're also holding this plant that is such a grief keeper close to us whenever we're connecting to the divine through shaking the Wulav and the Etrog or with Hoshana or Hoshana Rabbah or these rituals where we would beat the willows on the ground in kind of the last, it's like, if you missed anything at Yom Kippur, now's your moment to really make sure that you're going into the new year fresh. So I really appreciate willow as an ally in that. Yeah, I hear you talking so much about willow as this grief plant and something that I was honestly worried I wouldn't be able to sneak in, but really wanted to ask about was the Being with Grief workbook that I illustrated. I feel like we talk, we've talked a lot about grief on this podcast, of course, because it's a Jewish podcast. And like you said, grief is a, a big part of Judaism, balancing that joy and grief. And I'm just curious if you could speak to the Being with Grief workbook and what the creation process of that was like for you and what grief means as a tool in your life. Yeah, I just said on because it's the project that I'm working on quite a lot right now because we're shipping them. So that's exciting. It's been a long project and it's such a joy to have the books in hand and be like, go off into the world. So Chloe Zelka approached me last winter. She started the COVID Grief Network with Noah Cochran and Catherine Everett Rowe and I believe others, but they had written this grief workbook and they were interested in having it illustrated. And I was just really honored to get to support bringing this really powerful resource to life. I know personally I've had really close people lose really close people and I'm often like I just have so much respect and reverence and heartache for the grieving for just for grief on that level and I often am like I don't know what to do other than just show love and try to be there and it felt like a very tangible thing or just processing things through art is really meaningful for me so I was really honored to be asked to illustrate And it's a series of journaling prompts, exploration exercises. Each one has an illustration. It's meant to be very scribbly to invite people to interact with it however they want. It could be a coloring book. It could be a journal. It could be a ritual guide. It ended up being about 60 pages, which is a lot longer than we thought. And that's great. And I hope that it really supports people. It was also really meaningful for me to get to, I've been doing really Jewish specific work for a while, and that wasn't my intention. It was how my world evolved. And I'm really grateful to also just get to create resources that can reach different people. What both of these are making me think of between removing the connection to Eretz Yisrael through the, I guess, innovative lulav that you're talking about, and then also the grief workbook, both of these sound like 
ritual that is being reinvented or ritual that is being modified to become more accessible to people. And I'm curious how you work a lot with liberation and liberation movements, how ritual can be a pathway to liberation or where you see liberation's role in ritual and ritual's role in liberation. I love that question. I just realized that I didn't totally answer one part of the last question on kind of the role of grief, but maybe it'll dovetail in here. But I just wanted to name that the grief, the Being with Grief workbook is designed specifically for people who are mourning a death loss. And that feels like a particular experience that I'm grateful that this workbook can offer support around. And then I think there's a different conversation around the role of grieving in our collective healing and shifting our, you know, we have such a grief denying culture and we've lost so much cultural memory around how to grieve together, how to grieve individually. And I think it's one of the places that keep us really stuck as a whole society. And that totally connects to ritual and liberation. I think it's what I mentioned earlier about creating spaces where we can imagine the world that's not quite here yet. Ritual to me feels like a place where we get to do that. I think ritual at its core to me is like partnering with the more than human world to create spaces where we can be creative, where we can vision, where we can move energy or shift things in our experience or mark time or call in something that we really want support in. And I think prayer and faith in general throughout time is often when you've lost all else. It's, that's the only thing left. And I think that's often been a basis for where religion or spirituality or, or faith comes from. It's like we actually need it. Otherwise, we don't have the spiritual resource to to do this whole life thing. It's so complicated. And so ritual just feels like such a deep life-sustaining practice to me. And what I mean by that is it can be so many different things for different people. It could be liturgical davening, or it could be lighting a candle and breathing, or it could be going out into the woods and sitting, or any number of other things. But in that way, it feels like one of the needed paths to liberation of a space, like grieving the things that are so messed up and painful and heartbreaking about this world is part of what's needed to envision something different, to have the spiritual resource to fight the things that are so hard. It's a way to find your people and build coalitions and bring our hearts together. I think that was a big thing I was thinking about a lot in my 20s was the power of spiritual community. And I was always like, if we figured out how to mobilize the spiritual, the people who are praying together, there's a lot going on here. But then where is that energy going? And I was just like, if we could figure out how to mobilize this energy towards change, a lot could happen. So it makes sense that this is the tra trajectory I've been on and that I'm doing liberation focused spiritual community building. But those are some things that come to mind. I love what you're saying about the role of grief in imagining something beyond what we currently have. And I think that's honestly a challenge Alana and I have been coming up against when speaking with people who push back on our ideas, whether it's anti-Zionism or a million other things that we are talking about. And they're like, how dare you or how could you or kind of these accusations that usually stems from people not grieving their relationship to this thing that they thought was going to turn out a certain way or the myths that they believed about it. And so I think that's really powerful and a step, as you said, in our grief avoidance society that most people skip when trying to transition from kind of mainstream ideas to these more radical leftist ideas. Something that has been really meaningful in my life is learning about initiation theory around rites of passage and the role of rites of passage in human development and in communal development. And what we're talking about is that grief plays a really big role in moving developmental stages individually from adolescence to adulthood of this kind of time of being very individualistic and ego driven in a way that's necessary for a life stage and for a developmental period, but also is necessary to face the challenging things and move into a place of service and creative livelihood and working to make the world better, whatever that means. And I just will name that I learned a lot about that from Bill Plotkin's book. I think it's called Nature and the Human Soul. Always problematic things about every theory, but I really think there's a lot in there also that's helpful in taking natural rhythms and understanding humanity and our development through them. And when you apply that on a societal level, 
it really feels like at least the United States is stuck in this adolescent space of greed and individualism and grappling with the self. And there feels like real collective composting that needs to happen that's going to be messy and painful. But I find thinking about developmental cycles like that compost, soil, seed, flower, fruit as really like hope giving for me when I'm thinking about the hard stuff. I love the idea of collective composting. There's a lot to get into there. So much of what you've touched on has been related to the natural world, even when talking about grieving this idea that we need to go through a collective composting and our life stages being connected to the world around us. Um, and I feel like something that's always resonated with me from your work are these connections to Judaism and the natural world at the same time or Judaism and agriculture. I'm curious how you see Judaism and agriculture overlapping. It's a good question. I feel very lucky to have grown up in a pretty ecologically rooted Jewish community in the East Bay area where often nature time was connected to, to Jewish community time. And they don't feel so separate to me. But ultimately, Judaism is an agricultural tradition. Like a lot of the ways that we mark Jewish time originate in kind of marking the season or the harvest in different moments. And that's something that I really appreciate about the pilgrimage holidays, Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot, and just the invitations of Jewish time. Looking at things through a diaspora lens, there was pre-temple times and then there was temple times where things were very place-based. And then we would go into diaspora again and again, and we had to learn how to change our place-based, temple-based agricultural culture into something that could move with us through different geographic and temporal spaces. And so I just think it's an amazing technology that our ancestors and Jews in general have given us that we are practicing these things that we're learning from books at this point, but the agricultural pieces are they're right there for us. And I think at this point, a big question for me is, okay, we shifted from place-based culture into books being our sacred objects because we weren't safe enough to really put roots down in the places where we were living. And... Now there's this big movement of Jewish farmers, Jewish agriculturists, earth-based Judaism in the so-called United States. And it's amazing. It's something I've heard people who don't live here, like, we don't have this in Europe. I feel like I take it for granted sometimes that there's really quite a renaissance happening in terms of Jewish culture in the United States. And I think one of the questions that comes up for me now is, are we safe enough to actually put roots down and return to the agricultural Roots, the agricultural memories that our tradition that we've been practicing for thousands of years actually comes from. And it feels subversive to think about it from that way. Anti-Semitism is on the rise and we are facing a lot of shit from white nationalism and it's scary times. But can we choose to be safe? Can we choose to keep stretching beyond what the books offer us and trying to reimagine and remember what practicing these things rooted in agriculture actually looks like? Something that hearing you say that made me reflect on is, are we safe? And how do we wrap in folks who are indigenous to this land, to that practice? Because what does it mean for us to lay down roots in this land that is not, it's not anyone's because of course land does not belong. However, is definitely not ours and who the colonial project of the United States has really harmed and taken away from. And so I don't expect any of us to have an answer for that because that is so much bigger than all of us. But it is interesting to think about how can we be good stewards of the land and what would it mean to just be stewards of the land in order to give that land back to the people who have been stewards of it for so much longer than we've existed here. And I guess that's a question, but I do think it's something that we should be thinking about in this holiday of giving thanks for the land and thinking about being good stewards of this land that we're living on and putting down roots in. You talked a lot about the Link If Legal project throughout our time together. And something that I think was really fascinating about that project is, to my understanding, when it began, it was always intended to come to an end. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's at least the sense that I gathered from it or if not intended to come to an end, I feel like the way that the project was sunsetted 
happened really intentionally in a way that I've never seen. And so I'm curious, because it was such an incredible project and undertaking, could you share more just about that creation process of Lincoln Collegial and what that sunsetting intentional process was like as well? There were two big questions in there. So I'm going to go back to the first one and then do Link of Legal. I just want to say that accountable land relationship was a big part of, it maybe was the sole focus of our work at Link of Legal was we're like, we're a diasporist Jewish land project. And that means we're doing the work of asking, what does it mean to build home here when the people on staff were settlers, descendants of settlers? And immigrants and just complexifying our relationship to land where we're like often land relationships are spoken about in a very binary way like you're a homeowner or you're a renter or you're indigenous or you're a colonizer and we really wanted to make more room in the conversation to just be like okay you and me land like what's here between us I think something I've thought about over the years is relating to the land where you make home as a partner where no partner is perfect Every partner comes with their trauma and their baggage and the things that you learn how to love them for anyway, or the things you learn to work with, or the gifts or the challenges or the ways where you have to be more sensitive to your privilege or the challenging things that you bring. And I think it really helps change the conversation when you think about it through relationship. And one of the core philosophies that we had around that, we would teach a a class called Diasporism, which was our analysis slash expansion of a concept that Melanie K. Kantrowitz coined, which I mentioned before, making home where we are and like decentering the nation state of Israel. And so we were like, what does that mean in the land-based context as of, as farmers? And one, we didn't really come up with an answer for that, but we were like, in order to even move forward in that exploration for ourselves, the kind of questions that we need to ask ourselves are, how am I in conscious, accountable relationship with this land where I make home? How am I in conscious or accountable relationship with the lands where my people come from, whatever that means to me, like my ancestral lands? And how am I in conscious or accountable relationship with the land of Eretz Yisrael or occupied Palestine? And there's obviously so many different ways you can answer those questions, but it was really helpful for me to put it into practice where I'm like, I have a land tax practice and I have a learning the herbs where I live practice or... I enjoy klezmer. Just there's a lot of different ways to touch into our stories through place. And we can't forget any of them. All of them are needed. And that's where we're like, we're diasporic people. We have a lot of different places that are in our place family. (laughs) And I just, I want to offer that I found myself getting into a place of I can't claim land relationship here because I'm a settler. And after a few years of occupying that space, I landed on that actually isn't a sustainable self-respecting kind of approach where it's not can I or can't I claim no claiming is happening but it's like how can I be in healing relationship with this land where my people being here has caused harm and I and we also are deserving of home and place and we can do the, the hard work of healing together so that's the framework it's imperfect but I just wanted to share that a little bit I think that thought process is really meaningful and thinking about how we can be in and healing relationship with the land is a, a really important outlook for us to take on. So I, I really appreciate you offering that. Definitely something I'm going to be studying with. And just to say a little bit more actually about the practice of that, for us looked like really focusing on land reparations. And we tried to, when we started fundraising our community, we used a model where we asked everybody to give a matching, an equal or higher gift to a Black or Indigenous or POC-led land project where they live. And hoping that would be an invitation and to find out what work is happening near you and make a connection by giving an offering and that we should be investing in Jewish liberation equally or more to BIPOC-led land liberation. I, I think financial structures are a very concrete, helpful way to think about these practices. It's definitely not the only way. But another way is like my store, my online store where I sell my art, I have a land tax that goes to Indigenous Project and to projects in Palestine. And that feels important. Just acknowledging the relationships between these things feels important. Okay, next piece. Creation of Link of Flegal and Sunsetting. Let's see. That's what to say about that. (laughs) Okay, I'll try to keep it brief because I feel like I've talked about Link of Flegal a lot. 
I joined Link of Legal, I think, a year and a half into its creation. I met Margot Siegel through, we both were organizing around Standing Rock, and someone put us in touch because we were both Jews organizing around Standing Rock. And that feels like a meaningful point in the coming together story. And through them, I ended up doing Adama and sticking around and starting to work at Link of Legal. And I was working at Isabella Friedman Jewish Retreat Center and Link of Legal at the same time for a few years until the pandemic. And I think I inherited the project of Link of Legal as a dream soup where it was like, there's this land, there's this reparations gift, there's this amazing community, there are chickens. What plus what do all those things equal? And I really enjoy like structure making. And so I really had a good time getting to join in the part where it's like, who are we? What do we care about? Who's our community? Who are we serving? And getting to build the organization that way. And really every year was so different. And it took us a long time to figure out who we were serving. We were a, a land-based project and a lot of our community wasn't local to us in terms of the queer Jews who wanted to be a part of it. And I think a really important part of the project was just being in neighbor relationships with our neighboring projects in this little valley pocket we were in with non-Jewish community. And I think that isolation is such a problem in Jewish spaces where there's just so much in Jewish life that it's so easy for us to go internal. And again, that kind of safety impulse and coalition building and solidarity and figuring out how to be friends across culture and difference is really important. I feel grateful for the opportunity to get to try. I think we tried a lot of different things. We tried something that was really joyful was building out a, a cultural organizing team, kind of folks who we saw as doing cultural organizing in their communities. We invited to help us dream and grow Link of Legal and articulate our theory and then also help us hold space at our retreats. It was really fun getting to all kinds of people would come help out in the garden or with the chickens and getting to have ritual on the land and then be in the garden or muck out the coop and then teach a class about diasporism and all of it being so full of song and laughter and the way that being out in a field getting dirty just softens you. I think it was really special. And I think a lot of the reflection that we would get, and there are so many different kinds of ways that I think it moved people, but people were really particularly moved by, oh, we get to have a, a place. Like we anti-Zionist queer Jews can have a space, even though it's a space with no infrastructure or electricity or water. It's This is a place for us and a place where we get to imagine and build together. And getting to do that over years was really powerful. It was not planned to be closed from the beginning, but what was planned was that the um, reparations gift, Wild Seed, acquiring the land that became Wild Seed, happened in the last Shemitah year. It just coincidentally happened that way. And I wasn't around at that time, but it was an invitation to use the Shemitah cycle as a real transition point. And so we always were like, this Shemitah cycle is going to be a particular thing. And by year seven, it's going to be either we're moving to a more sustainable location or we are totally transforming the project into something else or maybe we'll close. And I think we didn't really think we were going to close until the year before Shemitah. I forget exactly when. But ultimately, I mean, the COVID pandemic really made it clear to us how isolated we were. Like I said, a lot of our community was dispersed and we were living Millerton was near the watershed retreat center which is social justice retreat center and Isabella Friedman and so we would like get a lot of community from people just coming through for retreats and then once it was lockdown time we're like oh we actually don't have the community that we need here and that's not a sustainable vision for building life and housing security really changed with people moving upstate and it felt very impacted by the moment i think part of the intentional sunsetting piece was it felt like an opportunity for healing to get to choose to leave. Something we talked about a lot of stories of Jewish diaspora being you're running or you're fleeing or you need to go somewhere and you don't get to you don't get to bake the challah. You have to take it as matzah or you don't get to say goodbye to the things or you don't get to see your plants come to harvest. And it felt powerful to get to build a relationship with a place, build home. Temp temporarily and then get to have closure and invite our community into that 
closure process and that that grief process, honestly. Thank you so much for sharing so much more about that project. I remember being super excited about it just because Jesse and I grew up in the Hudson Valley. And so it felt really special to be like, oh, my God, here's this Jewish agricultural project taking place in the Hudson Valley. Um, And just to know that it existed is really special and really inspiring. And I think the idea of choosing to leave and being able to have agency over that grief and that transition is really meaningful. You literally have so many projects that feel so connected to this topic that I want to touch on. And I don't think we'll get to them all, which is I'm coming to terms with. But two things that I wanted to touch on briefly before we begin to come to a close are, let's start with the first one, because I have a habit of asking like 17 questions in one. But did you talk a little bit about the Jewish agricultural calendar that you helped create this year with, I think, the Jewish Farmers Network? Yeah, I've been really into Jewish timeline and Jewish time, and I feel like I got so many different Jewish calendars this year. And yeah, I'd love to hear more about that specific one. Yeah, totally. I know there are so many good options this year. I was like, you can measure the creative bubble by how many calendar options you have to buy from lefty Jews. (laughs) Yeah, that project, again, I feel really great. It's just like such a joy to get to illustrate brilliant people's ideas. And it's a very different quality than doing my own thing, which is also happening, but in a different a very different way. The Jewish Farmer Network calendar is a series of sacred texts that all reference kind of agricultural ancestors or biblical figures engaging with the land. And there's 13 illustrations for the 13 months next year. And it's something we started, I think, in December 2021. So it's been a long project. It was just really fun to get to illustrate, imagine what these spaces were like, We had a lot of back and forth about racial diversity and just how to make the illustration feel expansive and also true to history and Jewish Farmer Networks, like the people who their audience and their community, what would strike and be meaningful with that particular community. But I think it was really cool for me just to get to illustrate all of these ancestral figures harvesting and tilling and hanging out with sheep and just for my own learning. And now a lot of people come to me for Jewish plant illustration. So I'm just noticing getting to illustrate the seven species over and over again and leaning into it as meditation and just like, we're harvesting the wheat, we're harvesting the barley, here are the sheep, here are the figs. And thinking about what land relationship looked like back then. That's so cool. I, this, it doesn't feel like a, segue but it's something about like bringing the people together in the way of bringing the sheep together is where my brain went but I think what's really cool about all your projects is the way that you bring something really ancient or something really historic within Jewish community whether it's a Jewish value or a Jewish concept and bring it to our modern society to uh, I don't want to say that it always has to heal that's not the purpose of all of your work but to address something that's deeply rooted that people are still suffering from and that's really cool like a thread through all of these different projects and brings me to Sedek Lab which I wanted to ask about as well because talk about communal suffering and how we are addressing it and you're taking it on in once again another huge project and undertaking do you want to talk a little bit about what Sedek Lab is up to and your role in in Sedek Lab. Yeah, that's fun. I wasn't sure if we were going to talk about that. Yeah, Sedek Lab is a really special space. It's a multiracial network of um, Jewish movement workers and cultural organizers, community organizers, political educators and trainers, artists and spiritual leaders, all who have a shared focus around fighting anti-Semitism, racism and white supremacy. I'm new to it. I wasn't a member. I've been peripheral and a and a fangirl on the side for since it was founded five years ago. So I'm just learning what it's like in there since I started uh, a few months ago. And it's a really special space in terms of being just offering a different version of what movement culture can look like that's really grounded in resource and connection. And I think particularly focusing on how we can strengthen our movements by focusing on our our relationships. Like 
building a network, building the mycelial webbing, making sure that we're really strongly connected and therefore can align and feel like we have each other at our backs. So I know it's been really moving for me, just like learning what's happening at Zedek Lab. And me and Kat Macias, who's the other new co-director, we're still just forming as a team with Helen Bennett, dear colleague and co-founder of Zedek Lab. So there's not a whole lot going on right now, but, and summer is low call season, but often what Zedek Lab is up to is creating space for communities of practice around our roles and various struggles and being a space for mutual learning and collaboration, building shared analysis. And what we've done in the past is have had in-person nat- national gatherings and convenings and regional convenings, and then it moved to virtual during the pandemic. So that's something that we're thinking a lot about right now is like, what does our network need? What does the Jewish left need? What do we as individual practitioners need? And I guess one thing I didn't mention before is that particular focus on creating a structure of support for practitioners feels unique because Zedek Lab is supporting people as individuals, not as organizations. So me, if I was joining with my Link of Legal hat on, no matter what role, if my role shifted, I would still get to be part of it and all my relationships and my thinking, I would still receive support. And it feels like it gets to center our real relational webbing rather than the structures that we create to do the work. Thanks for sharing with us more about Cedic Lab. I actually didn't know very much about it until looking into it a bit more to talk with you today and the work that y'all do and just the idea behind it is really awesome and so we're excited to keep hearing more about Sedek Lab and the work that y'all are doing there. Jesse, would you like to ask our final question because you're always the one who asks this very chill and relaxed question? I just want to say for some reason this activates the same part of my brain that like when my siblings used to want to order food and you'd have to call to order it because this was like pre seamless. They would be like, Jess will call, Jess will make the call. And I'd be like, ah, okay, I have to get all these things together and now ask this. And I don't know why this is the same part of my brain. But anyway, I'm so sorry. So I have to ask the worst question after having these incredible conversations I get to say. If you could leave all our listeners with just one message, what would it be? And everyone goes, oh, God, (laughs) take your time with this question. And there's no rush at all. Jesse, you make this sound so much worse than it is. I think the thing that comes to mind, which maybe this is the through line of our conversation or maybe not, but I'm just going back to Sukkot being vision booths that we get to build every year and I think I just hope people can hold for themselves and be reminded that your creativity is your life and it's your gift. It's yours and you should protect it. And you don't have to be an artist and you don't have to be an organizer for your creativity to actually be like such a life-giving force for you to process the world, for you to offer your gifts to the world, um, and that it makes a, a real difference. And I think we can get really stuck on needing it to be a certain way to to value it for ourselves. Um, And I think that if we can hold that together, there's a lot more that's possible for us collectively. So I hope you get to experience a moment of that during the Sukkot. Yay, that's perfect. I love the idea of vision booths. I think you're right. That is a thread because that's something that I have latched onto every time you've said it. And I'm loving the idea of vision for in a vision booth. And yeah, I, I hope we can all create whatever that is for ourselves this season and always. Are there any projects that we didn't talk about or that we did talk about that you would like to promote, that people should look for, that we should get excited about? Now's the time. Whether your own or other people's. Ooh, that is a good question. Well, the one that's really on my mind right now is the Being With Grief workbooks. I feel so excited about them and they are available now. I haven't done a big launch yet, but they're up on my website. And I just hope that they are such a supportive and sweet and like cozy resource for people. It was such a fun project to get to illustrate a full book. And I hope it's fun for you to scribble all over and have all your feels. I'm trying to think if there's any other projects. Sacred Orchard posters and... The postcard series that was made from Dory and my project on sharing Jewish plants and In Our Hands, which is a poster about crafting Jewish protection with plants. All of those are available in my online store, which is soulwaste.com slash shop. And 
One resource that could be very relevant for this season is called Ushpizin, with an E at the end. And that is a zine that we made at Link of Legal in 2020 when we were like, we can't be with our people on the land. And how are the ways that we can create ritual together? And it was a really special project, just art, poetry, ritual guide, learning all about Sukkot. If you go to Link of Legal's website, you can download it there and may it be all over your sukkahs and you can cut it up and hang it from the skach and read the Ushbizin prayers and dream big. Thank you. I'll definitely be checking that out personally. Um, and for folks who are curious about some of the things we talked about in today's episode and some of the things that Sol mentioned at the end, all of that will be linked in the description. So go there and it'll all be there for you. Thank you all for listening, but most importantly, thank you so much, Soul, for being here with us and for answering all our lofty questions with a lot of twists and turns. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you, and I, I think it is so perfect that we got to talk for Sukkot. That felt really fitting in my mind. So I'm glad that you were down to, to chat with us and spend your evening with us. Such an honor. So fun to get to talk about all this with you all. Thanks for having me.